All right, uh, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, today's panel is on making the case for copyleft license in a, in a corporate FAST setting. So um, we're gonna go ahead and I'm gonna introduce our panelists. Well, I'll let you introduce yourself so you can do the short version and save some surprises for later. Okay. Yeah. Is that, is that sure. more or less awkward than me saying things about you? We Everything can start at awkward. the other end. No, it's cool. It's cool. Uh, so my name is Jessica Mars, and I work at Intel, and I am on the team that uh, runs our open source, we call it the PDT, the product development team, which oversees the, the use of and release of open source software. Awesome. My name is Beth. Well, hold on. Am I on? Okay. Yeah. Okay. They just take a I sec just, to warm up. I, I have the FOSTEM. Fostem Funk, so I can't hear anything real well. Um, my name's Beth Flanagan, I'm the CTO of Togon Labs. I'm also the former release engineer of Yocta Project, um, and I do a lot of license compliance work. My name's, my name's Dwayne O'Brien, and I'm gonna keep saying until I hear myself in the microphone, okay? No, oh yeah, no we're... Nothing yet? Yeah, we're... we're um, the one with the funny bottom isn't. I have, I have, oh, we are. I have the one with go. the funny bottom that was not turned on, sorry. <laughs> uh, my name is Dwayne O'Brien. Uh, I'm the head of open source at Indeed.com, the job site. Um, I spend most of my time uh, either. That one is too high because it's feeding back. Yeah, I hear that. Um, let's wait for that to die. It makes the whole thing sound ominous, doesn't it? Right. Yeah, it yeah. does. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it just happened when I started talking, which is fine. We can share the good mics. Okay. 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 We'll share. All We're all about the sharing here we at Copy share. Left Kind. We, so. we will share the microphone and hopefully not the FOSS Dem Funk. So uh, uh, I run the open source program office at Indeed.com, uh, uh, the world's biggest job site. Uh, most of what I do is uh, design initiatives and policies encouraged to get employees involved and in contributing to open source and free software projects. All right. Uh, I'll start with the easy one. Um, so what are some compelling reasons why a corporation might choose a copyleft license and or what is the value delivered by copyleft? I feel like we're about to get struck by lightning. Okay. Reasons why a corporation might choose a copyleft license and or the value delivered by copyleft. Trying this one, working better. Am I amplified a little bit? Okay, sorry, I'll give that one back to you. So I, uh, yeah, well, gee, like that's supposed to be a softball one. I can't wait to see the rest of the ones that are on your <laughs> list. But um, no, I think one of, the, one of the reasons or one of the things that uh, adopting a copyleft license does is shows that the organization behind it, whether it's a company or you know a small consortium of friends, um, really respects, really embodies the spirit of free and open source software, just because the nature of a copyleft license you know, is guaranteeing freedom for users forever. Um, to be a corporation and to make that license selection is saying this is where we stand. I, I don't want to say that it's like a moral decision, but in a way it kind of seems to be, or political. Mm -hmm. it's, it's definitely not the, um, not the common choice nowadays. Mm. I think there's a, a large trend um, to license permissively, because I think people are trying to get as many eyeballs as possible, or you know, be mm. as business friendly as possible. Um, I personally think that's I think it's kind of short-sighted, but mm -hmm. um, I think the, the one of the biggest advantages is that um, that you're saying that you stand up for something. I have a couple other ones, but I don't want to hog them, so I will stop for now. But if you don't say them, then I will. Feel free. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, so I think another advantage, or something else that's inter or that's important, or that someone um, or that a corporation obtains by choosing copyleft license, is um, a, a more uh, passionate community. 
Yeah. Um, I think actually selecting a permissive license sometimes discourages people from contributing, which might seem kind of counterintuitive because you're like, oh, it's like such a low barrier to entry in terms of only having to read like 15 lines of a license. But um, I, I think there, there's a large number of people, and I could be wrong, um, but a, a large segment of the developer population that doesn't necessarily inherently trust large corporations mm. and when you're putting a license on a project that basically gives you at any time the ability to change the license and I'm not talking about you know I'm assuming that you're not putting a CLA on your project because the CLA is like even worse that's totally telling you I'm setting people up you know for this asymmetry of power um, but mm. uh, the thought that hey I'm giving something away that someone else might take or mm. close off later um, I think that discourages a certain segment from contributing. Great. Uh, do either of you have something to add to that? Yeah. Um, so, so my, what I normally deal with is corporations who are utilizing open source and creating products. They're in creating embedded devices, and um, the majority of the situations I have to do is convincing them: yes, these are legal requirements that you have to do. Um, mm. And then they go, oh, we're just not getting whatever the number Jim Zemlin threw out this year, seven billion uh, euros worth of free operating system all for free. And I'm like, no, there are legal requirements that you have to do. Mm. Part of my job is to step them through that and work with their legal departments and explain this. And once they get that, mm -hmm. then it's, oh, we want to be good community members because mm -hmm. we're consuming this. Mm -hmm. um, so I make business cases around that. So here is this thing that you are creating a entire product line around and you are selling this and you are not going to have a seat at this table. Yeah, a seat at the table is a big one. Yeah, so they see that and they go, oh yes, this affects our bottom line. Um, so yeah, most of the time, like, you know, I'm a free software hippie. I can go and I can make that argument and it falls on deaf ears. Mm. Um, so I make business cases around this. Yeah, I, I think it's worth um, sort of recognizing that the, you know, like the company that I work in is primarily, you know, we provide service, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so the considerations that we have are gonna be very different from a company that's doing you know, shipping embedded Linux on, on, on hardware devices mm -hmm. or, or other profiles. So. Um, Navigating um, even consumption policy and making sure that everyone understands what's required uh, uh, under copyleft licenses, um, it, it has an overall effect on how they think about the licenses and how they choose to license their software going mm -hmm. forward. Uh, it doesn't help that, um, I don't know if Max is in the room, but uh, over the, a couple of days ago I heard him refer to it as the uh, compliance industrial complex, right? Does so much. Uh, Turn our Right. Um, uh, do, does so much to push it as sort of a, a fearful narrative uh, in a way to sell their services. Um, and when you are on the consumption end, you have to push back against that a lot. And, and it definitely has an effect on how licenses are chosen. Mm. I want to pick up on some of the things we've uh, been talking about. And like, how do you overcome that non-commercial uh, sort of idea that's floating around or and or the like, what if we get sued? Like it's uh, you know that you hear from the compliance industrial complex. Um, so I, I don't know if there. We start with the business, uh, the business uses, and uh, how you overcome the non-commercial, if you like. Is that? No, I, yeah, so I don't know that it's directly to the to the question you're you're asking, but it's in it's in there somewhere. Okay, that's um, fine. Uh, so much time is spent, especially if a company is young in their understanding of the issues or if they don't have um, uh, legal counsel on staff who has a deep understanding of these issues, so much time um, when you come into it is just spent pushing back on the word bad license, right? Um, and uh, every time that you hear that, if you're advocating for uh, the licensing internally, it's really important to stop and say, well, you know, like, the license does exactly what it's designed to do. That might not work for the considerations that you have, but we, we don't use the word bad or venomous or poisonous or viral even, right? Um, like these licenses do exactly what they're designed to do and pushing back on that language is, is often the first thing you have to start doing. 
Yeah. Um, as far as overcoming the, oh my God, no business is gonna wanna use our software if we GPL it, um, I just like to point to other successful copyleft yeah. projects, right? And also tell people, or tell stakeholders, you know, maybe it doesn't have to be strict copyleft, maybe it can be weak copyleft, kind of dip mm -hmm. your toe in. Um, but really, I think being able to provide some proof points that, you know, look at, wow, Red Hat, they're being bought for $34 billion. It's an, oh, they sell a, They've got something. They, they're doing something. Yeah. Um, so no, the fact that something is open source doesn't mean that you you can't make money um, at all. Uh, you know, maybe think beyond just charging for the software. What about the services? What about consulting? Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, can it be a loss leader for some other product that you sell, like perhaps hardware? But yeah, yeah. that that should that one should not be um, top of mind. Did you want to add to that, Beth? Um, yeah, uh, uh, okay, so specifically to what, what was the word? The copyleft oh. industrial complex? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. The compliance, compliance industrial complex. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah <laughs> We're the copyleft industrial complex, <laughs> right here. The compliance um, industrial complex, I don't, I don't know if they got their So, so uh, most of my clients are releasing hardware and very small amounts of understanding around it. And Embedded has traditionally been bad when it comes to copyleft because mm. they didn't come from that world. And it's like, oh my God, if I release all this, I release all my IP. Well, it's not your IP. Mm -hmm. It's someone else's IP. You are complying with their license there. And within the Embedded world, uh, and in hardware in general, we understand certifications. Mm -hmm. We understand FCC, we understand UL, we understand this. So what I do, like, and I am really upfront and honest, I am carrot and stick. Mm -hmm. Here's SFC, they are my stick. Compliance, compliance uh, uh, um, activities are my stick, and then here's open chain, and this is your, you know, you can do this, and here's git commits with, you're at blah, 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 dot com there, and mm -hmm. this shows that you are contributing to the projects that you are consuming and that you're a good open source uh, contributor, and when you go and look for open source developers, we look for that. Mm -hmm. This is how you hire people, this is how you hire good people. So, like, most of the time when we have to do this, especially from Embedded, which is weird because, mm -hmm. It's a very different industry to a lot of software uh, industries. Um, we explain it in terms of uh, conformance to uh, a, a specification, conformance to a certification. And once they understand that, it gets it immediately. Yeah. I was just gonna say, as far as education goes, I think that's really key when people throw up an objection they're not saying no, necessarily. Mm -hmm. I mean, no is no, but an objection, actually take it as an opportunity. It's a chance mm. for you to do some education. It's a chance for you to find out more about you know, what, what their concerns are and then alleviate them. So objections can be a good thing and it's a learning process. And like you said, once they finally get it. And I think what's actually really important when you're doing the explaining um, is not to be pedantic and actually shouldn't be doing most of the talking in, uh, in classic sales, there's the thing, the 80-20 rule. Uh -huh. And actually, as a salesperson, you should only be doing 20% of the talking. Hmm. The customer sh should be doing 80%. You should be doing 80% of the listening. Mm -hmm. And in, in doing the listening and drawing the customer out or drawing out their, their concerns, you learn more about what's valuable to them. Mm -hmm. And once you understand or have an understanding of what's valuable to them, you're able to frame the benefits of copyleft in ways that really resonate with them. Mm. And so there's a, a magical formula, and I'm gonna forget it now, but when I do remember what it stands for, um, no, it's uh, superior value delivery. And basically, mm. this is a, a rule of sales that says when you can deliver something of sustainable value mm -hmm. to a customer, or what they believe has value, mm -hmm at a price that's going to allow for some sort of profit for you um, and that delivers a tangible benefit for them that's superior to anything else that's available, mm -hmm. 
and it actually, how, how superior it is, it can be a small thing, it can be a quantum, but as long as it's a hair more than anything else, you will always mm -hmm. get the order. You will get the sale. Mm -hmm. And so once you're able to, again, you know, frame copyleft in terms of a benefit that's meaningful to them, mm -hmm. and they, again, through the dialogue with you, come to the realization that, oh, wow, no, it's this copyleft thing is good. It's not that you're telling them copyleft is good, but again, drawing them out and then putting things back in, in terms that are resonant for them. You've got a believer. And, and then I'll shut up, but um, no, I was gonna say, in the process of doing this, you're also becoming a trusted advisor. And mm -hmm. I think that's something that's really important, especially for people who are members of open source program offices, because you, you are the expert, right? The domain expert. Mm -hmm. And when you take people through this process and they have this revel, um, realization, they remember that you are a part of the journey. And as corny as that sounds, they become a repeat customer. They come to you again, and it gets easier each time. All right, so, so let's talk about that a little bit. Um, you, you, you know, doubt the truth of no, that. No, no, I don't doubt the truth of that, but there, there's additional context I want to add. I, you know, I, I think the, it's pretty fair to say that the growth of the industry has far outpaced the growth of understanding, right? And there are companies, there are individuals, there are projects, there are, are people all across their maturity spectrum, right? There are people in this room who've been doing this two or three or however many more times longer than I have, right? Um, and so it, you really have to meet the companies and the individuals wherever they are and kind of recognize where they are in that maturity spectrum. And if you, if you try to take too big of a step the first time through, it's going to be counterproductive, right? I, I, can't, I can't go into a company who uh, is new and small and excited with a bunch of young developers and someone says, I want to release this awesome little JavaScript module, I said, and then make an impassioned case on why it should be GPL. Like it doesn't really fit in with the JavaScript ecosystem and they, they're just not there yet, right? Um, and so sometimes it's necessary to take a much longer view depending on where your company is and where your people are in their, in their level of maturity. Um, getting to the point of that, of that trusted advisor um, can be a long process. Um, and there's definitely things that, uh, there's issues that I get asked that I don't have the answers for, right? Um, there's only mm -hmm. so, <laughs> so much ground I, I can cover. And knowing when to tag in help is, is super important. So I, I have a question, like does it matter much whether your direct competitors are also using CopyLeft or are also, or are, you know, specifically not? when you're trying to make these business cases and show value? Like, is, that, is it different when it's like, oh, everyone else in our sector is using copyleft, or no one else in our sector is using copyleft? When you say in our sector, you're talking about the other projects in the ecosystem or the other corporations that we compete so with? So I think, here? like, and, and maybe this is, um, I, 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 I know that in a lot of spaces you're like, oh, you know, who are we trying to beat as a, as a company, like when will we know we've won? When we're as big as X, or we have as much market share as X, like, and it might not be one person for, or you know, one company for, it might not be a one to one. But I think, you know, if you're if you're doing like um, cloud service provisioning, then it's like you have some ideas of like, oh, one day we'll be as big as, you know. I have to be honest. Um aside from doing a quick scan just to sort of see what the lay of the land is in terms of you know, other projects in space, I, it doesn't factor into the decision. It's mm. just like a vague awareness of, but mm -hmm. as far as I've been involved now. Um, I, I think from the embedded landscape, um, everyone uses copyleft because your choice is starting from scratch. Um, so mm -hmm. it, 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 it's, it's not an issue of having to sell it. They're already sold. Right. They're, they're, oh, okay, this reduced my time to market, time to volume, great, wonderful. Um, it's, it's more guiding them into the other areas, contributing back, supporting the projects that they mm -hmm. consume, et cetera, et cetera. But from a convincing them to use it, convincing them to contribute back, um, contributing back is the hard one. That's the big goal. Yeah, that's the big goal. I, um, it, it's 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 kind of different as a service company, right? Like if, if I was to mm -hmm. take your question like directly on, right, and I was yeah. to you know uh, rattle off two or three competitors that you know kind of compete in the 
uh, employer to candidate matching kind of area, um, the projects that they release have nothing to do with what they do, right? They're infrastructure projects or they're, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, projects that uh, 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 give them insight into data or, or something like that. And sort of the, it's much more important or pr much more relevant with the licenses, I think, in the prevailing ecosystem or in the prevailing um, problem area uh, for the projects. Um, in general, I would say, you know, like, if, if they were proposing to do something that was unusual or strange or stuck out, if it's not clearly like a, a, an obvious positive, it's only going to add friction to the project. Mm. Okay. Um, so we, uh, we talked a little bit about the, like the non-commercial um, and, uh, and then you, you are starting to talk a little bit about the kind of community that, it, that you can attract with copyleft and I don't know if anyone Want to say more about that, like how important that is as far as like recruiting and things. Like, do you find that you get different kinds of candidates when you when you're? I think you do. I, I think with copyleft, you get people who are in it for for the long haul and who are interested in seeing the code be free forever. And if they get hit by a bus, that you know the project can live on or will live on. The fact that it it can't be closed off in a proprietary fork. Um, I just. Yeah, I, I do think you get a slightly different mindset. And I think also, um, no, I'll just leave it with that. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I, I'll take that one. Um, so, so I'm talking as CTO, not as mm -hmm. developer. Um, I don't know if we even kind of acknowledge that there's a certain cachet with being an open source developer. It's mm -hmm. like, oh, you get paid to work on open source. And mm -hmm. what I have found is the p folks that work with me, my coworkers, um, if they've come from a corporate environment, closed source shop, or a consuming open source but not really releasing it, mm -hmm. they are that much more excited to be working on this cool thing that was their hobby. Um, mm -hmm. When I started getting paid to work in open source, mm. um, I would keep a little notepad next to my bed. And you know those days when you wake up and you just really don't want to go to work? Mm -hmm. There were very few tick marks in that pad because every day I woke up, I'm like, do I want to go to work today? And if I didn't, I didn't make a tick. Or if I didn't, I made a tick pad. Very few because I get paid to do my hobby. Um, mm -hmm. And when I hire people to do that, they feel very fortunate for that. Mm. That here's this thing that I would do for free and I'm getting paid for it. So yeah, I mean, from a perspective of attracting people, that is the biggest attraction that like, I could, I could offer people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, you know, if we suddenly decided tomorrow that we wanted to hire 50 or 60 people to work on the kernel. Mm -hmm. right? um, I don't know that we've got, uh, you know, we have a couple of people internally who uh, we know do that work, but it's just not been a, a big area that we've hired people or needed to hire people. And uh, we would have to bank an awful lot on getting those people to advocate for us and say like, no, this is what it's like to work uh, on GPL code in the company because we don't have projects that are licensed under that. And we mm -hmm. don't have like a lot of vocal contributors who do that mm -hmm. work. Um, and so if you're looking down the pipe and saying, you know, okay, I think we're going to need to hire a bunch of people to do this work for us in two years, you can't start that in two years. You're going to have to start building um, reputation and growing contribution there today. Cool. Uh, I'm going to do one more question here, and then I'm going to open it up to the audience for questions. Um, so just to kind of lead on that, and you, you talked about the very first step of acclimating people of like, oh, we don't call them bad licenses or viral licenses, they're just licenses. But what's the, what's the next step? What, like, what if someone's like, well, okay, I'm ready to like, hear a little more. What, what's your next like, couple of things that you might take someone through to get them acclimated? I, I, I bring them to these, right? Um, I, I try really hard to get as many people um, from inside the company out to other events um, because uh, they're going to get so much better acclimation from the crowd and from the variety of things that they can pick from than me going through like the process of convincing them. 
Um, I think it's the single best tool that any company has to help grow this understanding, and I think it's the one they use the absolute least, right? Mm -hmm. um, you think about how much people have to fight to go to a conference in a typical company. You know, you get $1,200 a year. That has to include your ticket, your flight, your hotel, and your food, right? Um, so you're not going to anything in San Francisco unless it's one night, right? Um, <laughs> you're, not going to, you're not going to FOSDEM unless you're flying like, in a suitcase somewhere. Um, and uh, in that kind of environment, it's really hard to get people out. It's actually, frankly, if I was to be honest, it's one of the reasons that we were so active as sponsors last year was to like, hey, now we have these passes and we need people to come do things. Why don't you come out and, and like, you know, do a little bit at the booth and then go meet all these other people? And it, it decidedly had an effect of getting people energized and excited to get involved in the community in ways that were never going to happen if I just like tried to explain why it was a good idea, right? So. Mm -hmm. um, the best thing I can do is connect them to other people and get out of their way. Yeah, I think immersion is the best way. Um, what, uh, one of the things I do when I visit client sites, especially if there's other developers there, um, I bring hardware toys and I'm like, here's this cool new open source thing and they get really excited. And, and even if that company is not doing a lot of mm -hmm. open source work, those developers, your developers are going to be your best advocates in a mm -hmm. corporation. Um, I can sit there and fight with legal all day, mm -hmm. and they're going to say, you don't have a JD. And I'm going to be, you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. um, but if the developers who get a paycheck from that same company are fighting legal, they can fight that battle 24-7. So I bring them to these. Um, last year, one of my client sites, I, like, a month before each conference, I tell them when the conference is, yeah, you should send them, like, like, you guys are really close, you should go to this conference. And immersion is the easiest way. I have seen developers who spent 10 years in corporate world doing, you know, corporate stuff, and they get jumped into FOSDEM, and their eyes go as wide as plates. Mm. Because it's the world that they knew existed, but they've never seen it. Mm -hmm. Um, so when they see it for the first time, it just like opens up brand new uh, uh, pathways for them. You can add. Yes, I, people get excited. I said, but the other thing they should do besides getting immersed, and they get all you get a lot of mm -hmm. enthusiasm. Then you teach them the secrets, the sales techniques. <laughs> um, oh my gosh. The, the sales team. No, but you teach, if people Sorry. learn then how to channel that enthusiasm, because one of the things that uh, you know, I alluded to earlier is if you're just listing off, rattling off all these random benefits and you're not actually tying them to concrete things that have value to the decision maker. And so in this case, I'm thinking of the customer, the decision maker as the person who's deciding which license is going to be put on this corporate project. Mm -hmm. um, by equipping the developers with some of the vocabulary, some of the techniques, say, hey, whoa, no, you're super excited about this, but you're a little less flag waving, and like, here's one or two mm. other things you can do, I think you can get a lot farther. Fantastic. Um, so, audience, uh, Nick no, is gonna just... take one of these microphones, and then you raise your hand, and he will come to you so that it will be is that microphone the right one to do that with? Okay, let's start with Amanda in the back. Thank you, it's slightly tangential, but one of the issues I had as in-house counsel was dealing with law firms, and the understanding of copyleft that they have can be really problematic because they don't have the benefit of a community of developers around them. So often as a lawyer, you will discuss the issue with the development community and they will steer your view to find a good solution. The law firms don't have that, in my experience, as they scaremonger. I mm -hmm. wonder what experiences you've had with that and how you've dealt with it. <laughs> uh, um, somebody shot a number off the top of your head. How many legal experts in copyleft and open source policy do you think there are? 11. OK, 11, right? Yeah. How many companies need one? Mm. All right, so why aren't we all getting law degrees? I'm looking at you. <laughs> like, like there, there's, a, there's a tremendous need for this. I, I don't want to do it because no. But um, there's a tremendous need for it. Um, 
And so <laughs> getting people, oh, yeah, soon to be 12. You know, when, when, when our lawyers have questions, even no matter what I tell them, it's like they're still going to have to con consult outside counsel for it. And there's people that they're connected yeah. to. Um, uh, I generally um, try to connect them to a broader set. I really desperately tried to bring one here, um, but uh, it conflicted. Try to connect, connect, connect them with some of those 11 and some of those um, who might be adjacent to those 11, right? Um, mm -hmm. Who understand you know, more of it than I do and can speak a common language with them. Um, and even that is, is, you know, we're gonna get somewhere with some of that, but um, connecting them, again, connecting the people that, that I can't, that, that are gonna answer the questions better than I can is the best I've been able to do. Mm -hmm. I was just gonna add one thing that we've done or, or that um, actually Alexios, who spoke earlier, has done, is he works with a couple of local attorneys on a weekly basis and is training them in some principles of programming Ooh. to really help them understand more of what the licenses mean, you know, in terms of practical, this is linking, this is everything else. So if perhaps you can avail yourself of a benevolent um, developer, I think that would be very helpful as well. And I think, again, most open source developers um, are really happy to share their knowledge. You know, as they, yeah, they can help elevate you, and at the same time, they're elevating themselves. Cool. I don't have an answer. So my, oh. <laughs> yeah, Nitya, go right ahead. So my question slash statement is that I know the panel is addressing why companies should open source their projects and use GPL or copyleft as a license, but some of the other issues that that often are in companies is that you don't allow the intake of GPL. So mm. I was curious as to how all of you address the concerns that companies have in their policies of not allowing copyleft, um, because it's easier actually to open source your project as copyleft versus intake as copyleft. Mm. Education. So, because <laughs> there are no bad licenses, right? But some licenses might not be good for your use case. And so I think it's really important to educate the developers or the people who are doing the intake of software to understand the different categories of licenses. And, you know, if they understand what the product that they're designing use case is supposed to be, they should be able to make some, some easy decisions like, oh, wait, copyleft might not work in this one. I should perhaps stay away from it. But um, definitely ed education. And again, that there is no such thing as a bad license. And definitely we try to correct people if they start using words like contamination or viral. It's not that there's anything bad, it's just that some things aren't right for the particular use case. Um, I don't have an answer for that, but I, I, the, one of the problems that I have in some of my clients is they do not under any circumstances want GPL free. Hmm. And especially in embedded and there is no amount of talking I can do to sell them on that um, one of the things that I like that open embedded did is all the GPL 2 forks are now on their own separate layer and if you want GPL 2 yeah you you go forward port all the security patches for bash GPL 2 um, and I don't know the answer to that because I think that that is the, yeah, it's an emotional thing. Um, well, well, it's an emotional thing and they're, they're, they're stuck between, like if there's DRM on the device, they're gonna go, ah, uh, we're, we're it, and I, it's something that needs to be solved. I don't know the solution for it. I wish I did. This is the t clause? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Post Snowden era and Internet of Everything that. Sorry. Post Snowden, Internet of Everything, all connected. No, it, it absolutely is terrifying and unacceptable for users not to have control of the software that's in their devices. So I'm going to start playing that one up a little more, too. Uh, for, for a company that's more software focused, um, uh, if they're isn't a policy yet and you have the opportunity to inform the creation of a policy, um, then you've got a real opportunity. If you're inheriting a policy, um, it probably looks something like these licenses are okay, these ones um, okay in this circumstance, and these ones absolutely not. 
And if the only change you can make to that policy is these ones require additional scrutiny, right, you've made a little step forward. Um, and the little step forward is what gets you to that next one, right? Um, a lot of times, a, po a policy like that has been written by someone who, like, they've heard things, they don't understand, someone said, uh, what should this be? They did a, a couple blog posts worth of reading, and they said, okay, we're just going to solve a whole bunch of problems by just saying no and, and trying to move on. And if you can shift that to, we're going to start looking at them, then your next little step can be, like, maybe pushing back when they say, we don't think we should use this, and you think there's actually a good reason for them to, and kind of get them to that next place. So. Um, Language, I think, is super important in these conversations, and a lot can be accomplished with just managing to successfully change a couple words. Hey. Hi. Um, so the focus of, of this, what I've heard from this panel and a lot of other uh, talks in this kind of space is always focusing on, like, convincing decision makers, um, which sounds really nice. Uh, if you have decision makers, but if you were to hypothetically work at a company with 500 developers, all of whom make decisions with no oversight, <coughs> sweet. It's I'm just I'm just like I'm very curious about like because the the it's not the lawyers telling them not to use the GPL and it's not the manager telling them not to use the GPL. It's their like cultural like sensibility or something like they just decide like oh we can't use a GPL license on a intake or an outtake because of we, th we think that probably that wouldn't be a thing we could do uh, how do you reach a whole company instead of reaching when, when you don't have choke points do you have any <laughs> any ideas about that Is it like anarchy? I, is there like a biz dev? What, what's the strategy of the business? And there has to be a choke point or a decision making point. I can't, I can't imagine <laughs> that there's like 500 different developers just randomly releasing software under different licenses without any sort of coordination with... Oh, well. <laughs> there is a wiki page. It's the part that the recording did not get. I hate to say it, but I'm, I'm really concerned about the long-term prospects of your organization. There, there needs to be some sort of strategy. Um, mm. Yeah, I... I would say set up an OSPO right away. <laughs> Good answer. Set up an OSPO right away is another suggestion that has come from the audience. Yeah, so, who's going to yeah, but who knows, who, who knows to go to it? And, that, and that, that's a problem, right? You've got... Uh, an existing group of 500 people who are accustomed to doing things the way that they are accustomed to doing them, um, and uh, you want them all to start thinking in a different direction. You can't touch 500 people that way on your own, and you can't do it all at once. Find five, right? Um, find five who you know draw some water within the community of 500 uh, developers whose opinion um, carries some weight to it, and who you think are convertible or already amenable, but just, you know, don't have a path laid out for them and lay a path out for them, right? Um, look for opportunities to make it easier for them to go in the direction that you're trying to steer your culture than it is for them not. Um, and find some, find some champions to help carry this forward. You can't do this yourself. I have literally nothing to add, but I really want to know what this, where this place is. I really want to know. Like, like you can whisper in my ear afterwards if you want. Um, that sounds amazing and horrifying both at the same time, and I'm not sure which. <laughs> like, like, I literally have nothing else to contribute other than that. You are blowing minds up here on the panel, just so you know. I, I, I can't wait back to go back and see the expression on our faces as you're explaining this problem, because I think we all have. Yeah. Like, 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 even if, if there's an organization with 500 developers all banging away at code and no one, no one to coordinate this, you have senior developers. You, you, someone in there that people respect for whatever reason, find those people with that influence and start converting. Cool. Um, is there another question? 
That's not what, what, where is this magic <laughs> anarchist place? So you've made open source software and it has a copyleft license and you're distributing it or shipping it in products. Um, how do you explain compliance to um, these people? Because that can be a very intimidating task. And to add to Philip, how do you make compliance fun? Put the fun back in compliance? Yes. It's so fun. Well, I think you have to have lots of slides with kittens. Um, but so, yeah, I, I don't know. How, how do you make education fun, interesting? Um, you know, you could use something like software heritage to help relieve some of your compliance burden, as we heard earlier, in terms of being mm. able to make the, the sources available. Now, you said you've made copyleft software, or, right? You're, Oh, based on copyleft. So I didn't create it myself. I was going to say, so I've already released my source code. Well, but if it's based on copyleft, it other is, copyleft. Yeah, but it is, you know. Yeah. So, so I try to make it, I try to make the concepts easy to understand. And so I have some mandatory training for all my developers that explain the principles of open source software that, you know, different kinds of licenses. And I explain also that um, compliance doesn't have to be difficult. You just need to think about it up front. It's very painful if you wait until the very end. To, to think about it, but it can be totally easy, and then you know I try to make them you know understand why it's important, and hey, you know wouldn't you know if you did this thing, don't you want to get credit for it, and you want to see it, and you want people to respect your rights, and people start to internalize, oh yeah, no, it's only fair, right? I'm being a good citizen, mm -hmm. I'm helping pay it forward, um, mm -hmm. and making you know as much tooling available as possible that can release relieve the burdens if there's things that can automate uh, the generation of source code notices or if there's a, an escrow place or some sort of repository where you can put all of your build artifacts. Anything that can remove burdens is, is good. But um, yeah, otherwise, kitten pictures and chocolate. Mm -hmm. um, so on the training thing, um, when I do open source uh, license compliance trainings, one of the things that I do is they're yearly and no management is in the room. I have management training and then software developer training. And you can ask me all your questions and most of the software developers that I hit understand it or wanna figure out a way around it. <laughs> so I can do a shim layer, right? No, you can't. And then a year later, they will ask the same question. I'm like, no, you can't. I need to be reviewing your code more closely. Um, management just needs the top level stuff. They don't need to know so much around that. Um, as for making it fun, automate as much of it as possible. Mm -hmm. um, when I have to do firmware clearance, I'm clearing 7,000, no, 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 wait a second, sorry, 800 different packages um, that are all in basically a spaghetti mess of this is linked to this, this is linked to this, this is linked to this. Um, and in a word, it sucks. Um, it's just not fun um, because you really need to know, especially if you're doing firmware stuff, how this is built, what we're building it with, how this is packaged because, you know, you have your patched archive and yeah, we're not shipping documentation. That's not the license of this. We don't need this. So it, it's understanding the build process, understanding how things get built together, how things get packaged together, how things get blasted to the firmware and do it once, automate as much of it as possible so you don't have to redo it again. Even though I, I did use the phrase compliance industrial complex earlier, like when you need it, you need it, right? And it's not, it's not, I, I hope I never walk into the opportunity where I find out this is already happening and now I have to fight to make an understanding of why, like, this is the reality of your situation and this is what has to happen, right? Like, this isn't a negotiation. Uh, if, 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 if you get asked, like, how do we get out of that? you get out of that, right? Like, that's someone else's problem. Um, I, I wouldn't take it on. Mm. All right, I think we have time for one more. There are no more questions. 
Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, have you ever put out any uh, success stories with uh, adoption of external copyleft code? So, you know, we did it and our limbs didn't fall off or something like that, that is addressed to other businesses? Like, I, I think specific success stories you may have shared. Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, I think you're asking if we've published any of our own successful copyleft stories. Um, or, or inbound copyleft stories. Um, I know we haven't. Yeah. Are there other specific examples of other successes that you might use or recommend in making your own case? I mean, we talked about Red Hat. Um, I think everyone is aware. <laughs> do, do we want that on the recording? <laughs> um, well, um, like, let's, but let's. Keep so, it positive. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay, so without naming names, right? Um, the, the churn in the licensing conversation right now um, has an overall effect on people who are building open source program offices, sometimes in, in very new companies or in companies there isn't a great deal of legal understanding. And, and as I was talking about earlier, like it, we've grown faster than the understanding and um, things were stable in the licensing conversation for long enough that the people who were in these positions got around, even if they weren't in charge of running an open source program, they, they felt like they had it pretty well worked out, right? Mm -hmm. And now three or four big things that have caught attention over the last couple of years um, and the net effect that has is now there's all this uncertainty um, that you have to help them navigate. Uh, mm -hmm. And so there's a, there's a fall on effect from um, uh, these, these other kinds of uh, conversations that spark out of the license conversation that uh, aren't even, not even concerns when it comes out, right? Like you know, 20 other businesses who've built open core business models could decide they want to reach vanity licenses tomorrow and they would do it for their own reasons and they wouldn't have any consideration for the effect on the licensing landscape and the conversation outside of that. Um, and it's, it's not something that we're doing a very good job of managing or being thoughtful with. Hmm. All that right. had literally nothing to do with answering your question. I'm sorry. Sorry, and we're just about out of time. Uh, if I don't know if anyone, if you have any closing remark or like one thing you forgot to say or rallying cry. I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> uh, Deb, do we have time for one more question? Uh, sure. As long as it's not a, you know, it's a question, right? No, it's not. So you're like, it's. So the timer starts now. Okay. Because there was um, like intake copyleft and open core and all these things, just one narrative that worked for me pretty well. Mm -hmm. If you had any um, bad examples of open core, like this happened to us, we had this, okay, we found out it is open core after the fact, and now we're concerned about open core and we're concerned about the, what we call the bait and switch model. One narrative that has worked for me is, you know, there is a world where this is hard to do and it's if there's distributed um, copyright and a copyleft license you are pretty safe that there can be no like bait and, bait and switch model and they can't change that after the fact and it has worked for me in our organization to some extent that's that well, yeah no, that's really good um I was going to say that that's one of the great things about copyleft is it keeps it free forever. And in terms of, yes, things that we wanted to close with, like I had like little pages of notes here that was going to talk about the business processes. But anyway, um, the perceived value paradox, the fact that when people can get something for free without having to think much about it, they actually tend to value it less mm -hmm. than something that they even paid just one penny for it or had to exert any any bit of effort for it, and mm -hmm. copyleft is a little bit of effort, but I think that it definitely makes people perceive the software as being more valuable. So think about that. Cool. Beth, any closing remarks? Uh, not really, other than like my latest hobby has, uh, I wanna tell people about my latest hobby. Can I tell them about my latest hobby? You have like 45 okay, seconds. Okay, I have 45 seconds. It's uh, finding, oh, here's this new IoT device, okay. <laughs> Let's see, did you use Open Embedded? Okay, you did. Let's go look for this. And it's getting better. Oh. It is getting better. 
Um, I was at a uh, t- trade show, like one of the corporate trade shows, and I went open embedded, open embedded, open embedded, open embedded, and only most of them were in probably violation, but there were actually a few people who were doing it right. Um, Fluke, um, they, they were doing it right, and I was really pleased to start seeing this adoption, especially in embedded space, which has been notoriously horrible at this. Um, they're starting to do it right. So, so it's not impossible. No, it it's not impossible. Done. It's just going to take another 10 years, hopefully. And there's the bad news. Anyway. Um, uh, I, we, we do have to wrap up. Uh, our lovely panelists will be here for, uh, around for the afternoon. Uh, I would love to give them a round of applause for sharing your knowledge.